Uh, my name is Rob Crable, and I'm a Northwest representative with Defenders of Wildlife. Um, I'm joined today by Troy Wood, who is the manager of the Department of Natural Resources uh, Derelict Vessel Removal Program. And today we're going to be presenting uh, our webinar called Keeping Afloat, Coordinating to Combat Derelict Vessels. Uh, on the call, on the webinar today, Troy will be going over the derelict vessel removal and prevention programs that are available at the DNR, talk about ways that uh, local governments and other uh, agencies can take advantage of some of those programs. And then we'll also be discussing some ways that uh, groups and other local organizations and governments can help out with preventing derelict vessels from becoming a problem in the first place and to help expedite the removal of those vessels. Before I turn it over to Troy, though, I wanted to provide just a little bit of uh, background and insight as to why Defenders of Wildlife is involved with this project. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Defenders of Wildlife is a national nonprofit. We uh, work to conserve uh, wildlife and the natural habitat that they depend on throughout North America. And I work in our Seattle office, uh, which focuses on Northwest issues, uh, especially salmon and Southern resident orcas. One of the issues that both salmon and orcas in our region face is the problem of pollution. Pollution degrades salmon habitat can directly kill salmon and will bioaccumulate up into orcas, which causes a host of health problems, as you can see here in the slide. Um, one of the sources of, derelict, uh, of pollution is derelict vessels. Uh, you can see down here at the bottom corner where uh, that's a source of pollution. Stormwater runoff is also a concern, but regardless of where the pollution is coming from, it will enter the food chain and slowly build up and magnify until it reaches southern resident orcas, which is a big concern of ours. Um, this is also more than uh, just a Puget Sound problem. Pollution can enter the aquatic and marine ecosystem anywhere in our state. Uh, and when they enter the and when pollution enters the food chain, it has the potential to build up and eventually reach either the Columbia River or any one of the Puget Sound tributaries, which will eventually reach salmon, orcas, and cause a whole host of problems to other wildlife along the way. Um, derelict vessels can cause pollution by either the uh, pollutants that are on the vessel itself. Uh, and then also many vessels have pollution on them, especially older ones, which still have chemicals like lead and paint and things like that. So it is a big concern uh, and an, a source of pollution that uh, we would like to see addressed. Fortunately, the DNR has a really great program to deal with sources of pollution that are impacting uh, salmon, uh, orcas, and other marine and aquatic wildlife. Uh, the department deals with both derelict vessels and creosote treated uh, pilings, which is what the picture on the right hand side of the screen is. And both of these programs have made a lot of progress in cleaning up our aquatic lands and state waters. Defenders of Wildlife supports the DNR's effort to remove both of these sources of pollution, and we're very happy to be partnering with them today on this webinar, as well as in other projects to help uh, increase the education and awareness throughout the state about the problem that derelict vessels uh, pose to our marine environment and to aquatic and marine wildlife, as well as ways that folks can uh, actively help to reduce uh, the impact that these vessels have on wildlife. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to uh, Troy with the DNR, and he can provide uh, more information about the state's program and ways that you all can be involved and help. So Troy, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Rob. Um, as Rob stated, my name is Troy Wood. I work for the Department of Natural Resources in the Derelict Vessel Removal Program. Uh, it's a small portion of the, the Department of Natural Resources but we like to think that we have a large uh, impact on our mission here at the DNR. So I'm just gonna talk to you a little bit about our program. It's, it's a large in-depth program uh, run by three people for the whole state, but uh, I'm just gonna go over the top of it a little bit, maybe talk a little bit about how you can contribute to the, the issue of derelict and abandoned vessels. And then uh, we'll answer some questions towards the end. So today, I'm, like I said, I'm going to go over the program a little bit. Um, I'm going to go through the structure of the program, which is rather important because there's two major portions to it. 
one of them being prevention, which is the vessel turn-in program and our outreach program. Uh, the other is the removals, but uh, our authorized public entities and how they can uh, contribute to the removals as well and where their authority lies. Um, and then this is how you can help. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, move on. So the derelict vessel removal program, like I said before, it's just a small part of the part of the Department of Natural Resources. But we do work closely with our federal, state, and local governments, like the Washington Department of Ecology, Fish and Wildlife, the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, all of your ports, uh, counties, and cities are authorized public entities and therefore can use the derelict vessel removal program. We address the problems of abandoned and derelict vessel throughout the state, but we're the last resort to that problem. We like to think of ourselves as the garbage men. We're the last ones to come around and pick things up. We promote the owner responsibility primarily. Um, we also promote, promote prevention through the owner responsibility, which is the owners can turn in their vessels to the vessel turning program. We also promote it through an insurance requirement for long-term marinas, both public and private. And then we're not a response agency, so we don't have the initial response. Uh, that would be the Coast Guard, the Department of Ecology, your local law enforcement, fire department. Those are your first responders. So the authority for the program gives us the authority to remove abandoned and derelict vessels up to 200 feet. Um, and they pose a threat to human safety or the environment. The process takes 30 days, which means we have to post the vessel, wait 30 days, and then take custody of the vessel. And then the owners have 30 more days to protest our custody with the Pollution Control Hearing Board. We're not in immediate response, like I was saying before, but we, we do in that first 30 days, we're willing to do some initial work by contacting owners and stuff like that um, to see if we can get a responsible party to take care of the vessel before the state has to step in. Our funding comes from uh, three different sources, but uh, for the derelict vessel removal account, it's just two sources, which is the, the recreational boater registration and commercial uh, vessel registration through the Department of Revenue. Now the program also gets a third source, which comes from DNR itself, and that's part of our 10% contribution, which I'll get to in a little bit. So we're charged with uh, maintaining a, a database, an inventory of all the derelict and abandoned vessels that have been reported to us. So we have an inventory uh, and database, a GIS database for spatial uh, referencing from uh, 2003 to current. So uh, that's part of our mandate. Another part of our mandate is to provide guidance and assistance to authorized public entities in navigating the Derelict Vessel Removal Act. This program has been held as a model, not only national wide, but international. The, the Canadians up north have uh, modeled a large portion of their program based off of uh, our program and, and others in the United States. Some of the tools that we use to deal with the derelict vessel removals is not only the Derelict Vessel Removal Act, of, which is RCW 79.100, but we try and use other avenues as well. And those are some of the RCWs and WACs that we would use. Um, if you have any questions about those, I'd be happy to go into those, but uh, just some of the major ones would be the Anchorage WAC, uh, it ties into the derelict vessel removal program very well. Uh, in fact, part of the, the program refers to Anchorage. Uh, vessel uh, private recreational docks, um, that also plays into it as well. Uh, as well as the mor mortgage providers and trespassing and unauthorized use of uh, state aquatic lands as well. 
So the legislation that we currently have started in 2013 and 2014, and it was represented by our uh, state representatives Hansen and Smith through House Bill 1245 and 2457. The bill focused on uh, a few things. It created the vessel turning program. It gave ecology the, the authority to board vessels for spill uh, prevention. It updated the vessel registration laws uh, and it did a few other things. And one of the major things that uh, it did was it created this secondary liability, which means if you sell a vessel that's over 65 feet and and older than 45 years old, and you don't go through the proper process of having it surveyed and do uh, turn in paperwork to the Department of Natural Resources, you'll retain secondary liability. All that means is you won't get a ticket or anything. It's just if the vessel goes abandoned or derelict and we have to remove the vessel and the current owner is unable to pay for that removal, we have the ability to go after the person who sold the vessel to them or the company to them and seek restitution for those costs. So, uh, and secondary liability is also a part of us. The state is not exempt from that as well. So if, if a state agency sells a vessel without going through the proper procedures, they can be held liable as well. So uh, another thing was it made the, uh, a surcharge on the registration permanent. It added the $1 per foot for the commercial vessels so they can contribute to the fund. And it also added the insurance requirement for marinas and tenants. So the insurance requirement, again, like I was saying before, is part of our prevention. And that helps us to what we're trying to do with the insurance is to encourage owner responsibility and to maintain their vessels so that they don't become abandoned or derelict. Uh, these are two vessels here that did not have insurance and ended up sinking inside of a marina that did not require them to have insurance. And unfortunately, that prevented that marina from accessing the derelict vessel removal account when it came to accessing the funds to remove those vessels. So they had to maintain, they had burden of removal and they had no relief from that. So they had to pay for it themselves. So the insurance requirement is for both private and uh, public marinas. Uh, it's uh, it's for all mortgage operators and providers for long-term mortgage. And it's also for all tenants. So tenants have to maintain insurance as well as the uh, mortgage operators have to maintain that insurance as well. Now, they're not required to verify this after they sign the tenant agreement. So when they sign the tenant agreement, you just verify they have insurance and that's all you're obligated to do by the RCWs. That's not what all the marinas have been doing, but that's all they're obligated to do. So if your tenant cancels his insurance six months after getting a, a signing a tenant agreement, that's not on you, that would be on them. So we wouldn't hold you responsible for that. So failure to follow the insurance requirements makes it so that uh, you're, you're not breaking the law in the sense that you're going to get a ticket or go to jail. It just removes your access to the derelict vessel removal account. If you have a vessel that sinks in your port and you need assistance removing that vessel, but you didn't require that vessel to have insurance when you should have, then you're not allowed to get 90% reimbursement for the removal of that vessel because you did not require the insurance. And that's, that's what they're talking about there. So, and what they're talking about the secondary liability is you're going to end up having to pay for that and then you're going to have to go after the vessel owner yourself so um so haul out insurance requirements um 
I've been getting a lot of questions. How do I get hauled out if I don't have insurance? Well, there's some ports out there or marinas out there that will haul out a vessel if you have a bond so that you can get insurance on a vessel. So uh, I, I don't see a, the insurance requirement stopping people from getting hauled out to get insurance. So this is just an encourage a prevention measure to encourage ownership responsibility so that they can take care of their vessels um, before they become abandoned or derelict. And that's another reason for the transfer law was to ensure that they're not just dumping these vessels on poor unsuspecting people that might have dreams and aspirations of owning a vessel but have no idea what it takes to maintain one. So the transfer law, all it does is make sure that the vessel is in seaworthy condition so that when the owner takes it over, they don't automatically start out from uh, behind and having to uh, repair a vessel that they have no idea how to do. So part of the our mandate is the the removal account access to it, and that's through um, reimbursements and stuff like that. So who has access to the account? The accounts run by the Department of Licensing, which means they collect all the funds. They collect all the funds from the registrations and throws it into the account. The Department of Revenue gives the, the money they collect to the Department of Licensing so they can put it into the account. Now, DNR is the only one that's authorized to remove those funds from that account in relation to the Derelict Vessel Removal Act. So who has access to that account through the Derelict Vessel Removal Program? Authorized public entities have access to that through the reimbursement program, as well as the vessel turn-in program. And private mortgage facility operators do not have direct access to the account except through the vessel turn-in program, or their local authorized public entities can contract with the private mortgage facility to remove vessels from their premises. And a little bit more on that later on. So the funding, like I was saying, comes, comes from three different sources. So you can see the sources down here. So the blue is where the registration um, funds would uh, accumulate. That's the that portion. And then ALEA, which is uh, the portion that um, DNR contributes and that, that source is from the sale of gooey ducks and the lease revenues and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So the reason why we have this portion in here is because whenever DNR removes a vessel, we're only allowed to draw on the derelict vessel removal account by 90% as well. We still have to put up 10% of the removal costs on our own. So that's where the ALEA comes in is that 10% as well as the derelict vessel removal account only authorizes one person um, administrative costs. So DNR saw the need that just one person couldn't handle this program all by themselves. So they contributed a little bit more so they can increase the personnel. So that's why that, that portion is a little bit larger than just the 10%. So the database, we get reports. This is this is our reporting form. We get reports from all different sources. We get them from um, regular citizens. We get them from law enforcement officers, local authorized public entities, as well as vessel owners themselves uh, reporting their own vessels. But this information that is collected here goes into our database. And once it's into our database, then we, we don't remove it. It stays in there for uh, forever. And one of the reasons for that is we try and track ownership of those vessels because the Department of Licensing deletes all of their vessel information after six years of inactivity. So if someone doesn't register their vessel for six years or they incorrectly assume that if they um, document their vessel, they don't have to register it. So if the Department of Licensing doesn't have any activity for six years, they delete that information makes it really hard for us to find owners that way. Um, so that's why we try and, and maintain a database of vessel owners until the vessels are destroyed 
obviously. So the database looks like this. This is our space. This is our spatial GIS database. All of these individual boats uh, icons are vessels that have either been removed by the owners or by an authorized public entity or are in the process of being removed or some of them are just newly reported and haven't been removed at all like these green ones. The green ones indicate that they're reported but they haven't been removed. So we can uh, not only get an idea of where they're located but how many are in a general uh, vicinity as well. And that comes into play with our priorities which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about later on. So we collect all that information off the reporting form and it goes into these data fields so that we can uh, not only sort through the data by individual fields, but it helps us uh, project future derelict vessel issues or it, it shows how much it costs to remove a, an old wooden sunken boat that's 30 feet long, stuff like that. It just uh, helps us with data analysis. This is one of the reports that we produce with that information. And this one is, in particular is available on our website. So any vessels of concerns that are on our list, so all of those green ones that I showed you in the previous slide would end up on this list. And they're, pri they're sorted through the priority level. So priority ones, twos, threes, and fours as it goes down. Uh, this is one way to show that uh, how many vessels we have on our concern list because we can't get to them all. So we have to prioritize which ones that we get to first based on our resources available, basically our funding. This is our prioritization chart. So priority ones are your emergencies. Those are the ones that pose immediate threats to human safety or to the environment. Um, those are the ones that are going to cause the most damage if we just walk away and don't do anything. Priority twos are still a threat, but they're not an emergency one. Priority threes, you can see as we go down in the priority levels that uh, the urgency is not there. So we try and expend um, all of our resources on the priority ones and twos and threes and we try and go that way. Now I want to go back to this other slide and I want to show you something about this. What, what, the reason why it's spatially important is if we're removing a priority one here and there's a priority two or a priority three that's nearby, if we send out assets to remove that priority one and it doesn't take much to grab the priority twos or threes, then we're going to go ahead and do that at that time because it saves money in the long run and it lowers per vessel removal costs. And that's important in the long run, but just to show you that if it's a priority three, we may not get to it for a while, but if there's a priority one near it and we're removing it, we might remove that priority three or four that's right next to the priority one. And the reason for that is the, the conservation of those resources and the availability of assets in that area. So our goal obviously is to reduce the number of derelict and abandoned vessels in state waters. Um, we've removed over 700 vessels, close to 800 vessels. And we've done that with partnership with uh, over 50 authorized public entities since January, 2003. That doesn't seem like a lot, but it's a huge number when you consider that we have 165 vessels on our vessel of concern list right now. Um, and this is 50 different authorized public entities, which means they have 50 different priorities, 50, 50 different funding sources, uh, 50 different ideas of what an abandoned and derelict vessel might be and how to handle them. So 778 vessels is quite an awful lot. Now that, that could be a vessel that's uh, 20 foot long, that's just a little dinghy or something, all the way up to a 198 foot uh, fishing vessel that we may have removed from uh, Foss Slough or something, or Foss Waterway. So unfortunately, these numbers aren't showing through right here, but you can still see the numbers and that's what's important. 
So the colors will tell you that these are recreational vessels. Okay, these are vessel turn-in program. And uh, this is former commercial vessels and then former military vessels. So those are the numbers. And you can see the portion of the pie as to how much they cost to remove. Now, I'm gonna tell you right now, unfortunately it doesn't show you here. Um, we'll have to fix that, sorry about that. But our per vessel cost removals is lowest right here in the vessel turning program. And one of the reasons why is we require that the vessel owner bring the vessel to us in the vessel turning program uh, to a haul out facility or a disposal site and stuff like that. So it saves those costs. We don't have to go out and get the vessel ourselves. Um, and that saves those costs quite a bit. So we can re remove a lot more that way. Now, if we go into the recreational vessels, our costs jump up to about 10,000 per vessel. And that's an average over that. And if we go into military, our former military vessels, that's, that's over 300,000 per vessel for removal, average removal costs. And for former commercial, we're looking at uh, over $93,000 per vessel removal. Now compare that to the 3,000, just a little over 3,000 per vessel in the vessel turning program. That's quite the difference. And so you can see that our prevention program is really key because we view that most of those vessels that we take in in the vessel turning program could eventually end up being abandoned in the Puget Sound or other state waters. And they would cost a whole lot more to remove at that point. So um, that's, that's the great thing about the vessel turning program is the costs, savings. Unfortunately, that program only has $200,000 that we can spend per biennium uh, on that program. And that's per biennium. So that's every two years. That's $100,000 a year. And we typically burn through the $200,000 in the first half of the biennium. So reimbursements. So access to the derelict vessel removal account by our authorized public entities are done through the reimbursement program. Reimbursements are not guaranteed, um, but you can bookmark or allocate uh, funds for removal if you contact me prior to doing any removals so that we can discuss options and priorities and, and then we can find out if we have funds available for that removal. And at that time we can bookmark them if it becomes a priority for the dialect vessel removal program. Otherwise, go ahead, remove those vessels and then you can submit an application for 90% um, reimbursement and those get paid based on a priority basis and based on fund availability. So what should you do for a reimbursement? First thing you need to do is just report it to us. We'll assign it a, de a derelict vessel removal program number and then we'll also assign it a priority level as well. We'll walk you through the process for gaining custody, whether you're gonna do that through 79.100 or 5308, which is the RCWs covering the, the public mortgage facilities or ports. We'll, dis you, we'll discuss with you removal options and disposal options, as well as what uh, the US Coast Guard may or may not require for the removal. Um, we'll give you, like I said, we'll send, like I was saying before, we'll give you pre-approval or bookmark those funds if it becomes a priority for the derelict vessel removal program. Um, or like I said, you can proceed without. Remove the vessel, then you'll end up removing the vessel. And uh, when you remove the vessel, you can also use DESs or the Department of Enterprise Services master contract. So there's two. One is the emergency removal and the other is the routine removal. And what that does is it gives you access to pre-approved contractors that have gone through a vetting process already 
for insurance, knowledge, capability, and financial stability. So that all you have to do is fill out a work order. It takes about 10 minutes to fill out. You send it into DES. They go through all the contracting problems. They put it out for bid. They deal with any protests on the, on the bids. They present to you the lowest bid and ask if that's acceptable to you. And if you accept it, then they award it to the, the bidder. And then you just become a contract rep at that time just to make sure that they're doing the job that you requested of them. Under the emergency one, all you have to do is call an authorized public, um, I mean, an authorized contractor on that list and tell them you want to hire them under DES under this contract number and they'll go out and get it um, and charge you for the, they'll only charge you the costs based off of the contract rate. Every authorized public entity in the state can use these master contracts. It cuts down on your contracting personnel costs. It cuts down on your time investment in, in removing vessels. It's a highly encouraged program, but it is not necessary or required for you to get reimbursed. So um, after you've disposed of a vessel, you're going to fill out your application and I'm asking you to include photos of the vessel photos of you posting on the vessel, also uh, all of your notifications that you followed either under RCW 79.100 or 5308, all of those uh, notifications, legal notifications need to be sent to me with the application so that it can be audited for compliance with the RCWs before it is reimbursed. So if the funds were pre-approved and you went over those pre-approved funds, and the funds are available and those costs were uh, acceptable, you'll be paid for the, the full 90%, not just the pre-approval costs. However, if uh, those costs were not acceptable or something that we'll just discuss that at that, at that time. It has to be a priority for the derelict vessel removal program and based on funding availability. This website right here is where you can get the reimbursement form I recommend you download it off the, our website every time because sometimes we update that form for different requirements. So the vessel turn-in program is another way to access the, the derelict vessel removal account. This is part of our prevention program, as I was saying before. And part of this program is to capture those vessel owners that have gotten in over their head. They're not, uh, they're not capable of taking care of their vessel. Their vessel has gotten into such poor condition that they can't financially or they don't have the ability to deal with their vessel at, this, uh, at that time. So this vessel right here, I just want to point out to you, was in a marina and the vessel owner was living on board. He was living off of uh, Social Security he had two sump pumps running on the vessel at all times just to keep the water out of his living quarters. And every time the power went out in the marina, the mar marina manager had to run down there with a gas generator to plug in his sump pumps just to keep the vessel off the bottom. The vessel owner was above his head. He couldn't pay, pay for repairs. He couldn't move on to land. He was having a whole lot of issues. So with the help of the marina manager, we got him to turn in his vessel into the vessel turn-in program. We got him some uh, assistance in uh, low-income housing on shore, got him moved out of the vessel, and we were able to tow the vessel out of there and get it hauled out and destroyed instead of having to pick it up off the bottom of the marina, which would, would have been a lot more expensive. And with all the stuff that he had on board, it would have been an environmental uh, disaster. So like I said before, the program has $200,000 allotted to it per biennium. And we usually run through that in the first year. We're not quite through that this year. So we will have a little bit more funds running into the second half of this biennium, I'm sure. But we're running short on that. So if you want to use this program, sooner is better. And we would always 
accept funds for this program if you want to go above the $200,000 we're accepting contributions at any time. The vessel turning program continued is, is this is just some examples of, of the vessel turning program's successes. So an owner passed away and left his vessel behind. Who's going to deal with that at that time? Well, the marina took possession of the vessel and used the vessel turning program and turned it in that way. That's how a, a private moorage facility operator has access to the derelict vessel removal account. These are some other instances where we've had major successes with the program. Otherwise, those vessels would have been cut loose or they would have sunk eventually in the Puget Sound, causing other issues. So these are the criteria. I'll go through that here shortly for the vessel turning program. This is our flyer with the criteria on the back side. Uh, I would ask that you download this off of our website and post it on any of your bulletin boards or hand them out to any of your, your vessel owners that you noticed are becoming uh, less desirable or their maintenance is, uh, is being obviously left behind so that maybe we can get those vessels into the vessel turning program. So here's some of the eligibility criteria for the vessel turning program. So we're talking about, you have to be, a, just some simple stuff here is you're, you're gonna be a, a, a resident of uh, Washington State, you have to have proof of ownership. Um, so, and then if you don't have proof of ownership that you have to go through certain um, forms and stuff like that, we work with you. We can help you navigate this stuff. Um, it's relatively easy. The hardest thing is probably finding a notary of, uh, to uh, notarize your signatures and stuff like that. Um, so, it, but if you're a marina, you have to make sure that you have the insurance requirement in your marina, because again, that'll deny you access to the derelict vessel removal account. So some more of the criteria is typically we don't take vessels over 45 feet. That's a case by case situation, but it has to be a pretty high priority for us to go above 45 feet. Because once you get above 45 feet, the costs just are extremely more than, than they are for less ones. It, they just go up exponentially from there. So we try and save those costs so we can remove more vessels instead of just one large one. So uh, photos, again, are required. They speak volumes. We ask that all the trash be removed, stuff like that. Uh, just some simple stuff. So if the vessel is accepted, we ask you to take it to a, a drop-off location. Um, the reason why is it saves us on costs. So if you're in a marina that doesn't have a haul out, that might be something like, we're asking you to have it towed to a marina that does have a haul out, um, something like that. If it's in a marina that has a haul out, then typically uh, we're done at that point. We'll just accept ownership of the vessel and have it hauled out and destroyed at that time. It, it takes us a couple of weeks to process an application, mainly because we're prioritizing our removals, working on other removals, and trying to find out uh, the lowest cost options to remove that vessel. So authorized public entities, some of their challenges. Uh, following the RCWs can be challenging. They're not exactly written with plain language. Um, we've navigated them quite often and we're always here to help out with that situation. We can pro provide templates for all the legal notices because we've done that so many times we have templates from, for most of our authorized public entities already out there. Uh, reporting the vessels. We, there's a requirement out there for all the marinas to maintain a, a, uh, information on all of their owners. And that's, in, that's very important because if an owner should pass away after six years, that information is, is deleted out of, out of the, the 
the Department of Licensing database, so we have no record of it, so we have no way of finding owners. I mean, obviously, in a, in a case where the owner has passed away, it really wouldn't matter, but if the owner moved to another state or something like that, which happens quite often, then we would be able to track them down for cost recovery. We educate vessel owners on their disposal options, on how to properly dispose of a vessel or who to contact to help them ass assist them with that. A lot of uh, ports and marinas will haul out a vessel and destroy it for their customers uh, at a cost, obviously. Um, but there's options out there other than just hauling it to a landfill. There's recycling options as well. The derelict vessel removal program is always available to come out to an authorized public entity's location and provide training on the program. So we can discuss with you your personal uh, situation and how the derelict vessel removal program can assist you in your particular situation. We're always willing to come out and talk to you about stuff like that. So some of the removal challenges that the program has, has come across are um, ownership ambiguity, obviously. Um, again, the program is the last resort. We're the garbage men. Funding, we don't have a whole lot of funding and that's why we have 165 vessels on our vessel of concern list because not only are authorized public entities removing vessels and then asking for reimbursement, um, but we do remove vessels as well. So that cuts through the, the money pretty quickly. Last biennium, we ran out before the end of the biennium of funds. And when we did our uh, end of the biennium reimbursements, we weren't able to reimburse for the full 90%, which is unfortunate, but uh, we're trying to prevent that this biennium. So um, there's a small pool of contractors that are capable of doing these jobs um, and willing to do these jobs. There are plenty of people out there who think they can do it, um, but aren't able to do it. And that's why we encourage you to use the DES contract because those are the people that have been vetted and proven that they have not only the knowledge, but the ability to do the removal work hazardous materials you never know what you find on these vessels we've had meth labs on vessels drug dens on vessels uh, just collection of household cleaners and stuff like that so you never know what you're going to find on these vessels and, and a lot of the times we have to find out the proper disposal methods for some of those materials after we identify them there's a lack of storage in disposal sites and in some areas of the state there's even lack of uh, haul-out facilities. In Grace Harbor, there's one haul-out facility that can only accept three vessels at a time. Um, so a lot of the vessels end up being uh, sinking at their moorage facilities. Uh, there's three vessels sunk on the Hopium River right now uh, because they were kicked out of a moorage facility and ended up at an illegal marina and they eventually sunk because there's lack of haul out facilities for not only maintenance, but to get these vessels out of the water when their useful life is, has, uh, trans has ended. So speaking of their useful life, so everyone loves boats when they have high value. And as they get older, their maintenance uh, costs increase. At a certain point, um, vessel owners are looking to offload their vessels because their maintenance costs are more than the value of their vessel. And destroying a vessel is expensive. So the cheapest route is to sell the vessel. And that's one of the reasons why for the transfer law, unfortunately it doesn't stop anything below 65 feet. So you can have a 40 foot vessel out there that's being sold for 10 bucks because the owner knows that the vessel has no value, but sold it to someone who has a dream of owning a vessel. And that's where the high risk comes in. Those are the vessels that we're really looking for in the vessel turning program. We're really looking to encourage the owners to do the right thing by helping them dispose of those vessels. So here are our owner accountability. We uh, do hold owners responsible for removing the vessel. These three vessels 
owners were taken to court and judgments were, were granted in almost $2 million and 90 days in jail. So uh, not that doesn't happen in all cases, but uh, we try to do that in most of our cases. So the program challenges, private property issues. So if a vessel ends up on a private property, we don't have the authority or the jurisdiction to go in and remove it. We have to get the private property owner's permission. It's not in our jurisdiction, but it's within an authorized public entity's jurisdiction, whether that's a port or city or county, they have the jurisdiction to remove vessels off of private property, again, with the private property owner's permission. The DOL deletes records, like I, I've been saying, evicting live aboard. So if we get a derelict vessel boat and it has someone living on board, it's hard to get their boat out from underneath them. Uh, so there's issues there liens and judgments, uh, those have been hard to navigate in the past, and cross biennium contracts and reimbursements and stuff like that. Uh, we're not allowed to pay for work done in, in the previous biennium, so we have to pay for all that work up to the end of that biennium and then start paying with the next biennium's funds for the work done in that biennium. And that can be confusing with a lot of contractors. We've partnered with uh, many, uh, of our stakeholders out there, as well as the Defenders for Wildlife. They agreed to help us with this presentation as well as helping us pass out information like our flyers here. We just had new ones made up. We're getting them printed and hopefully we can get them mailed out to uh, anyone who would like a copy of these just to email me and we can uh, arrange for them to be mailed out to you. These are just flyers to help uh, owners navigate uh, how to dispose of their vessel and then as well as authorized public entities how to dispose of vessels and then this is just a general information for our program so and then our stake other stakeholders washington boating alliance the pacific coast congress i go out and speak to them they pass on the information to their stakeholders as well they're also a great uh, um, partners in this, but we also have others as well. These are just examples. So what can the marinas and managers do? Get the word out, basically. Um, follow through with the reimbursements. Report those vessels as soon as they become a concern to you. They should be reported to us, basically. So um, with that, I am going to turn it back over to Rob. And then when he's done, we'll open it up for questions. Thanks, Troy. Um, so just a few minor things uh, to wrap up with. <clears throat> As mentioned earlier, one of the big goals of uh, this webinar is to share this information and also encourage more increased coordination. And I think Troy really nailed that point home that um, we need to make sure that uh, when derelict vessels are found, that they're reported immediately, that there's monitoring going on, and something that would really help improve uh, the communication between uh, the DNR and all of y'all who are working on um, derelict vessel issues is to identify a single point person within your uh, government organization or whoever else, uh, and that would be helpful uh, as the DNR moves forward in communicating and providing updates to folks. Um, the other thing, as Troy mentioned, is education and outreach. Uh, Defenders is working a lot with the DNR to improve education and outreach efforts throughout the state. Um, as Troy mentioned, y'all can help out as well. And this is really part of the prevention efforts that are needed in the state. Uh, the DNR does a lot of great work at removing the vessels, but as Troy pointed out, that is extremely expensive to do so. And with limited funding, it's important to prevent vessels uh, before they become a problem in the first place. That also will keep pollution out of our waterways and out of our wildlife, which is something that we all wanna see. Um, so with that, uh, and there's the disposal guide as well. Um, the, the last thing that I'll mention is that Defenders is also working with the DNR to develop a, a resource map for folks throughout the state that will show where people can take their vessels and boats at the end of their lifetime. 
Um, so if you know of uh, any facilities like morage facilities, haul out facilities, dumps and recycling places that will accept vessels, please let us know so that we can include it in that resource and direct people to those uh, resources and facilities when they're ready to dispose of their vessel. Uh, so with that, here's uh, contact info for both myself and Troy. Feel free to connect with us about anything that you might have, questions that you want to ask offline, uh, or if you're interested in getting more involved with some of the education and outreach components and preventative uh, measures, uh, please let us know. Both uh, Troy and I would be happy to chat with you more about some of the things that we're working on and ways that we can coordinate with you further. So uh, with that, we'll open it up to any questions that folks might have. And try, I'll, I'll pass the controls back over to you so that you can unmute folks if they have questions. Okay, I should have unmuted everyone who... Uh... Yeah, I have a question. I, I'm sorry, I joined about halfway through, but um, I'm a marina owner. I've got a liveaboard that has two boats. The second boat is a derelict. Um, do you have funds at this time? If he does a voluntary turn in on that, it's a uh, 40 foot wooden Chris craft. Uh, yeah, we still have funds in the vessel turning program, if that's what you're asking. Um, and we would be happy to accept an application from him so that we can evaluate it further. I can't tell you whether or not we would approve it right now, but yes, definitely. Please have him submit one so that we can take a closer look at that. And Mark, I do see your question. The funds that are remaining in our account right now are close to $900,000 um, for the rest of the biennium. We expect that's including some bookmarks so that that money really hasn't been spent all the way down to that point. But um, yes, we still have funds in our account and we still have the availability to offer reimbursements. <clears throat> 